prayer like never before. How many of you want to be filled with the Spirit? Empty to be filled is the title of this message. Empty to be filled with the Spirit. You see, many of us want to be filled. I want to be filled with God's power. I want to have God's passion. I want to have direction. But you have to be empty to be filled. It's something that goes counter-cultural. In our culture, we, we promote pride and being lifted up and cl climbing, climbing the corporate ladder of success. And it's all about me. Where God's Word says to go up, you must first go down. Empty to be filled. And then tomorrow I'm talking about a different message actually. The empowerment. Empowered by the Spirit. The, tonight is empty to be filled. Tomorrow is being empowered by the Holy Spirit. How does one receive that baptism of the Spirit? The fire of the Spirit. The unction of the Spirit. I don't care what you call it. The key is do you have it? Do you have it? Because as we go into the times that America is going into. It will be absolutely critical for you to be filled with the Spirit. Filled with truth. Filled with wisdom. Filled with discernment. But the basic premise of tonight is this. I don't know if this is good English, but it's a good truth. The more emptiness you give God, the more full of Him you will be. So the more empty that you are of yourself, the more of God you can take in because there's less of you and more of Him. Now it's an interesting topic because there has to be a healthy tension because the Bible talks about and Paul talks about discipline, right? Paul says, I discipline my body. I bring it under subjection. And I, there's a, there's a self-control. There's a discipline there. And But on the other hand of the, the, the spectrum here, we have dependence. I am totally dependent upon God or I will fail. And so are you, correct? But there's a tension, what they call a healthy tension between dependence on God and discipline. They, they call this God's working in me, but he also calls me to do certain things. And one of those things is to empty myself, to humble myself. And the best verse for this is Matthew 5, 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Notice that key phrase there. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, it's a big distinction right here because many people forget the last part and they just say, blessed are the poor. And Roman Catholicism taught this many years ago. And that's where a lot of the, the poverty movement came from and the, the monasteries and things like that that were really not biblical because we don't see God blessing the poor. We see him blessing the poor in heart because you can be poor and prideful. Amen. Been there, done that. Have the t-shirt. So it's not poverty, a financial poverty, it's spiritual poverty. God, I am poor in spirit. Now, of course, we know blessed are the poor among you and that we're to supposed to help for those, help those who are in need. And, but what he's talking about here is poor in spirit. And I don't believe it's an accident that it's at the beginning of the Beatitudes. Many of you know what the Beatitudes is. Jesus gave this powerful sermon on being meek and humble and blessed are the poor in spirit and, and blessed are you when all men persecute you and say things, the evil things about you and blessed are you. But at the, at the very beginning of the Beatitudes, he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, poverty of spirit. There's, there's something in you that says, God, I am dependent upon you because we live in a culture that is all about self right now, don't we? Self-assured, self-reliant, self-sufficient, self-absorbed, self-determined, self-righteous. I looked up the word self in front of all these other words. There's hundreds of them. Can you believe it? Self, self, selfie. Selfie. Let's take another one. I, that, that one doesn't look good. Let's take another one. I'm not smiling. Let's take another one. My hair's messed up. Let's, it's selfie. Self, self, self fulfillment. Self gratification. Self exaltation. And God says, if you want to go up, you better come down. If you want to humble, if you humble yourself, I will exalt you. I promote you. Poor of spirit is a desperate need today. Now, in studying this, there is one word with self in front of it that I like. 
You curious what that is? Self-checkout. I love self-checkout because you can get in and you can get out. But the majority of the other words are focused on exalting self and self-righteousness and self-absorbed and self-determined. And, and it's all about self. And it is self-evident in our culture today that we need God. Basically, I can do nothing on my own. That is poverty of spirit. And many people, sometimes youth pastors or young pastors ask me, Shane, how do you prepare for the messages? What, what exactly do you do? And I say, well, you get on your knees for about an hour and you worship and you pray and you seek God and you break before him and you ask him to empty, empty your heart of all that is in, that in you that is not of him. And often they'll say, well, no, really, what do you do? Like, no, that, that's, that's the key. That, that this, this being desperate for more of God is so important that David Ravenhill, in his book, Surviving the Anointing, and I would recommend that. It's called Surviving the Anointing. Did you know that only one out of ten pastors actually make it through to age 65 and stay in the ministry? Most Christians fall by the wayside. They're, 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 there's, there's destruction and, and detours to destiny everywhere we go. And at the beginning of the book, the very first chapter, he says the number one need among Christians, especially Christian leaders, is dependency on God. Because when I am weak, he is strong. It's, a, it's self-dependent. Lord, I can't do anything with you. And you don't just say it to say it. You actually mean it. I recognize that he holds the very breath that I breathe in the palm of his hands. He owns all of my ways. He told the king that in the book of Daniel as well. And he says, you have not glorified me even though I own all of your ways. Many of you know that we have a ministry in the hospital homes. And I think it was about five years ago. I met a man, he's passed away since then, actually at Antelope Valley Hospital. I was able to baptize him there and talk to him before he passed away there. He was what they would call a quadriplegic. Was only able to move his head and look. And I remember that one of the first times I visited him and read the Bible to him. He, he, I got a call a few weeks later that he wanted to give his life to the Lord. And I, I came back to the hospital, but... I just, I just left there and I, I just cried in my car because it was, so, it was so impactful for me to see that he was sitting there and he said, can I have some water? And I'm like, well, sure, you can have some water. I don't care. And he actually meant for me to grab the cup, hold the cup, position the straw so he could just drink water. And I thought of that image. That is self that is not self-dependence. That is dependence on God. That picture. We're just, it, it's really, that word is a beggar. Blessed are the beggars. Blessed are those who, 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 who just, Lord, I, I just, it's like, you ever see those people who, they're really, the real beggars. They, they just can't, uh, that you see these in third, these people in third world countries on the side of the street. They are, they can't, unless somebody gives them something, they will die. And that's our condition before God. Lord, I am dependent upon you to keep my marriage together. I am dependent upon you to help me finish strong. I'm dependent upon you to get me through this sermon. I'm dependent upon you, Lord, to get me through my workplace. God, we are dependent on you. Let me make a national proclamation that our nation is dependent upon God as we go into the next election, as we go into all kinds of chaos. God, we are dependent upon you. You are our only hope. Unless you move, unless you protect, unless you bring revival, unless you begin to awaken our nation, God, we are lost. We are destitute without you. Oh, God, the spirit of the living God, would you move among us? Would you awaken your people? Would you secure? Would you bring peace? Peace and reconciliation, God, we are lost without you. And even though I'm a fan of the Constitution, and you'll see in there often, or when, or the early writings of the founding fathers, they would say self-governing. Self-governing. That's why America has been blessed, and that's why she will continue to be blessed, I believe, as long as we follow God. It's not that we are <clears throat> self-governing. We are allowing God to govern self. That God is the 
the, 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 the foundation of our republic, that God is the foundation of our families and of our marriages. Yes, our, there is a terrible past in, in many different areas, but overall, it was a nation that wanted to honor God. The Holy Spirit wants God's will. Myself wants my will. Same with yours. The Holy Spirit wants God's way. But the self inside of us wants my way. So as I'm talking about this, this point of weakness, I want to just bring your attention to 2 Corinthians 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm going to be all over the place on this one, so I might skip around a little bit. And I just want to encourage you, listen to last week's message. Did Pastor Abram do a great job or what? That was an incredible message on finishing the race. I know I was encouraged to so listen to that if you weren't here. Uh, but 2 Corinthians 12, Paul had an incredible counter encounter with God. We don't know exactly, but he was taken up. He saw things that, that people have not seen before. He experienced the glory of God. And I, I thought of Moses when he said, God, show me your glory. And I think it's okay. I, I still pray that sometimes. I don't tell my conservative friends because they might think I'm a little too charismatic. But I, but I pray, Lord, show me your glory. Show me the fire of the Holy Spirit. I want to I just have your presence and your power. I want to walk in that. God, show me your glory. Show me who you are. Show me what your name is. Is, your Bible says your name is holy, that you are holy, and God, show me who you are, that splendor. And Paul encountered God. And then it says, therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited. Some people say, some theologians say that Paul was wanting not to um, look to, um, um, get, in other words, he didn't want the people to elevate him too much, but I don't see that here. I see that Paul is saying, in order to keep me from being prideful, being conceited. Any of, you, any of you know when God starts to move in your life, sometimes you can become prideful? Oh, it's silent. We know, Lord, keep me humble. As God begins to elevate, one of the, one of the hardest things you will ever find is when God begins to elevate, it's important that you stay humble, that you stay broken before him. So Paul says, in order that I would not become prideful and conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh. A messenger of Satan to torment me. Wow. That doesn't sound too appealing, does it? But that word there, torment, could also be harass. I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me humble. And... <clears throat> Nobody knows exactly what this was, and I'm glad we don't because we would say, well, that's what Paul dealt with. I guess it doesn't affect me. But because of this, we can re it can relate to all of us. There is sometimes something in us that God allows, and I believe a messenger of Satan could be demonic opposition. That's often what a messenger of Satan would be. But also, and I'm going to talk about this more tomorrow morning. I'm going to really unpack this a lot more tomorrow morning, but I want to share a little bit with you because it could also be persecution. When people are persecuting you, or, we, we don't know exactly what it is, but God allowed something. He allowed a difficult situation. He allowed a bad habit, maybe that pulls you down, a lust that batters you, a physical problem that depresses you. Something sometimes is allowed by God. Remember, jo God said, have you considered my servant Job? I prayed, Lord, don't ever say, have you considered my servant Shane? Don't, I don't want to go there. I don't want the enemy, that kind of attack on my life. But there, God sometimes will allow the, the Satan to be able to give, be given some type of, 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 of influence in your life or some type of temptation that will come in. And it's not to defeat you. It's actually to humble you. So this messenger of Satan, this issue, whatever it is, we don't know what it is, was given to Paul that would keep him humble. And it goes on to say that Paul says, I prayed three times, three times, God, take this away. How many of you can relate to that? I know there's people here who prayed a hundred times. Lord, take this away. God, take this away. I don't want to lust like this. I don't want to struggle with this. I don't want to do, Lord, would you please take this away? And you can hear the still, small voice of the Holy Spirit saying, Son and daughter, my grace is sufficient. I will give you the grace and the fortitude and the strength to say no to that temptation. As a matter of fact, no temptation has overtaken you, but what is common to man 
But God will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape that you may be able to bear it, to endure it. So often God will use things that are difficult and and, and things that you struggle with. He'll use that to keep you low and and, and humble and not high and lifted up. And can you imagine if if we were able to conquer all of our struggles? That would be me like, like me saying, hey, guys, I know a lot of you struggle with things. I, I, I know how that feels. I, that was me many years ago, but I don't struggle with anything anymore. I just walk on water. I just, God visits me every night, and I just, uh, just have the, this, the feeling of the Holy Spirit all day long. I never get upset. I never get angry anymore. I haven't been depressed since, since 1998, and I know you will get through it. How prideful and conceited would a person become? So some of these things are allowed into our life, even physical problems. Things that God allows that keep us dependent and broken and humbled before him. And in short, my point is, when I am weak, I am strong. When you are weak, you are strong. Now, if we allow that weakness to turn into excuses and we continue in sin, that's not being count, that's actually being counterproductive. The, the idea here is Paul says, I'm getting, I'm getting uh, attacked in this area. I'm getting tempted in this area. But Lord, in my weakness, in other words, I'm not strong enough to overcome this. Amen. That's what young adults and teenagers haven't found out yet. That it'll happen later. They understand that, okay, God, you're on the throne. I'm not. I cannot overcome this in my own strength. God, when I am weak, then I am strong, Paul would say. Where's his strength come from? The power of the Holy Spirit. And again, I'm excited to just unpack this a little bit more tomorrow. But my whole point tonight was empty to be filled. I want you leaving here remembering the way to go up is to go down. You want the power of God in your life? Humble yourself. Apologize to your spouse. Apologize to your your, your children. Get real with God and confess that sin. Repent of that besetting sin that continues to take you down and humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. In due time, he will exalt you. Humility is bold confidence in a faithful God. We see our weaknesses and we turn to God rather than make excuses. I can tell often when someone is prideful. I've been there. I struggle with this. So do you. When we begin to make excuses. Well, yeah, I know, but you don't know what I'm going through. Yes, I know I need to work on that, but here comes the but. And, they, and these excuses begin to prevent us from changing. Do you know a lot of Christians never change? They, they stay stuck in that mode of defeat. They've got something they work on. They know they need to work on it, whether it's, I mean, the, how long is the list? How many people are here tonight? That's how long the list is. Everything from anger to lust to control to manipulating, to backbiting, slander, gossip, everything that's outlined in Scripture, people struggle with. And if you don't repent of that and say, this is wrong, I cannot continue, but you continue to make excuses, you will not change because that's pride preventing the work of the Holy Spirit from coming into your heart and into your life to work. How many of you here have heard me talk about revival? Revival is our only hope. And I'm not talking about weird things. I'm not talking about camp meetings. I'm, not, I'm talking about when God resuscitates his church, when he performs CPR on the majority of Christians in America, when he revives them. And I talk a lot about revival, but did you know that poor in spirit is going to be what ushers it in? When God brings revival whether it's a church, a community, that, 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 that spirit of revival, that sense of awakening, when he begins to awaken his people, it's, poor, it's those who are poor of spirit that usher us in. 
those who are humble, those who are praying, those who are worshiping and they're seeking God and they're, they're, th- that poor in spirit it, what, is what God, it, that brings revival because God says, I hear the cries of my children. I hear that weeping. I hear that poverty of spirit. I hear that brokenness and I must, I, I demand, it de- scripture demands that God answers that broken and contrite heart. I've got a proof text for the naysayers. Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah says, for thus says the high and lofty one. I love that language in the King James. Isaiah says, for thus says the high and lofty one. Basically, thus saith the Lord who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. His very name is holy. And that's why when they, they, those angels cried out and they shook, holy, holy, holy is the name of our God. And those enormous pillars on the temple, they would shake and the foundation would shake at the name of God. And holiness is his name. Holy, holy, holy is our God. He said, I dwell in a high and holy place with him who is prideful no I dwell in a high and holy place with him who has a contrite and broken heart a humble spirit what do I do thus saith the Lord I revive the spirit of the humble and I revive the heart of the contrite ones God says I'm looking for humility you humble yourself before me and I will exalt you I will promote you I will fill you with my spirit empty yourself of yourself and you will be filled there's another book I want to recommend I've recommended it before And you can find it, I believe, online. It's called They Found the Secret. They Found the Secret. Don't worry, it's not a book Oprah would recommend. This is a solid book about biographies of Christian leaders. Have you heard of Adoniah Judson or Hudson Taylor? John Bunyan, Amy Carmichael, Oswald Chambers, D.L. Moody. Those types of, of leaders. John Wesley. Possibly Whitfield is in there. I'm not sure. But this book, this book is so important because all of these people, the majority of them, it talks about how they were Christians, but they were basically dead to the things of God. They didn't have a passion for his word. Oswald Chambers was on the verge of depression. If you've ever read his utmost for my highest, one of the highest selling devotions of all time, you're probably wondering how did that happen? How did he almost want to quit seminary? He, he was so depressed. He had no desire for God. D.L. Moody, nobody even knew of D.L. Moody. He was just this prideful man wanting to build his name in Chicago. And you hear of all, nobody knew of them until, until they humbled themselves. Until they emptied themselves of, 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 of themselves of self. D.L. Moody said, Lord, I'm in the ministry because of my name, not yours. I repent. And the Spirit of God fell upon him. Oswald Chambers said, God, I need all of you. I'm trying trying to seek after education, and I need you. And the Spirit of God fell upon him. Adonijah Judson realized he cannot do missions in his own strength. And he said, God, I give you all of me. I am desperate. I am poor in spirit. And the Spirit of God fell upon him. And it's consistent throughout church history. Poor in spirit. God revives those who are spiritually cold. Are you spiritually cold tonight? I can guarantee you can leave fired up with the spirit of God. Deal with that issue that he's confronting, convicting you on. Deal with that sin that he is confronting and convicting you on. Deal with it. Leave it here tonight and say, God, I want to be emptied of myself. Emptied of pride and self-righteousness. God, I want to leave here filled with your spirits. And it says he he dwells, God dwells, his presence, his power, his anointing dwells in the believer who is of a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Now I did something I normally don't do, but I'm going to do it anyway. You ready? I grabbed an excerpt from tomorrow morning and I'm going to share it with you right now. I added it early this morning. And I'm asking the question tomorrow, I'm going to ask it to you as well. Are you resisting the Holy Spirit in this area? Are you resisting the Holy Spirit? And you know what I find ironic many times throughout church, throughout, I'm sorry, throughout not church history, but my history being a Christian, 
is there's a lot of talk of blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Have you heard that before? Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. I mean, we could get in even to how you can only blasphemy God, and that proves the triune nature of God, that the Trinity is doctrinally sound, that the Holy Spirit is God, but I'm not going there with that. You could also say the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is rejecting the conviction of the Holy Spirit, and then as a result, rejecting Jesus Christ. Amen? That's applicable. But do you know something interesting? I found this out about 10 years ago. As I'm reading about the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, do you know what the context is? The context of that phrase is Jesus was healing people. And they said, you're not, they said, the Pharisees said to Jesus, you're not doing the works of God. You're doing the works of Satan. So they were attributing the works of God to the works of Satan. Jesus said, you are blaspheming the Holy Spirit. So the context really, I think, is relevant to a lot of people. We have to be careful in this area. Are we attributing a mighty move of God's Spirit to the work of Satan? Are we not open to the work of the Holy Spirit because we've seen someone act weird on YouTube? Are we not open to the Holy Spirit because we've seen some weird churches do weird things? And we say, oh, that's not of God. That's blasphemy. That's weird. Be careful. Be very careful. I want to share with you three things happening when the Holy Spirit is really moving. Are you ready for this? Sit down, buckle up, and hold on. One of my favorite topics, the power of the Holy Spirit. Apart from salvation, this is my favorite topic. Do you want to know why? Because when he ignites you with the power of the Spirit, when he fills you with the Spirit, when you have boldness and unction and the Word of God comes alive, when you begin to fall on your face at home and begin to pray, and you begin to worship and pour out your heart to God and the Holy Holy Spirit is moving. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. Holy Spirit, come now and move among your people. That is the Spirit of God moving and convicting and drawing. That is the power of God evident in the life of someone filled with His Spirit. It's the dire need today. That's the difference between a living, vibrant church and a church that looks like a cemetery. You know the church that looks like a cemetery, right? Come on in, let's get seated. Brother Bill has a few announcements this morning. Then we're going to do a few songs of worship. I got my sermon down to 20 minutes. And the, fa the, the ladies boutique has a potluck afterwards. And we're just going to eat as much as we can. And just, just get through the day and get home because we said we went to church. Isn't that sad? Three things happening when the Holy Spirit is really moving. Number one, there is powerful worship. Now, I'm not talking about volume or music per se, but there's a desire to worship. When the Holy Spirit is moving in your heart, moving in your life, moving in the church, there is a desire for worship. I want to be at worship mornings. I want to be at worship evenings. I want to be at prayer meetings. I want to. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is drawing me to these things. If there's no desire for these things, you have to wonder, is the Holy Spirit really moving in your heart and in your life? Because there's always a desire for prayer and worship. And number two, people act differently. Now, I don't mean weird. Because I think the Holy Spirit has been given a bad name in many churches because of weirdness. You don't act weird often when the Holy Spirit is moving. You are broken before him. You are at the altar I remember I preached at church services where you could hear cries throughout the congregation and one service would flow into the next and you felt the tangible presence of the atmosphere of the living God. There's a, there's a difference. There's, you're positioned differently. You're, you're in deep repentance. You're not bored. There's, a, there's God working in your heart. And then number three, this always hap happens. Comfortable Christians become uncomfortable when the Holy Spirit is moving. <laughs> You know those people, I don't, like, I don't like to get out of my comfort zone. But the Holy Spirit draws us out of our comfort zone. 
And the modern day Pharisee in us will say this, that is Satan, Jane. All of that weirdness, that is Satan. That worship is too emotional. They sang that song for 15 minutes. My goodness, don't you know they're only about four minutes long? Why do they just sing that song over and over? That's brainwashing. No, sir, that's worship. That's worship when you're worshiping. God. You think the angels get bored after four minutes? But see, that's a Pharisee in us. That's not of God. That's, a, that's demonic. That's demonic. That worship is, oh, it's to this, it's to that. It's, it's demonic. No, it's not. You're blaspheming the work of the Holy Spirit because of an arrogant, prideful heart. The Pharisee must repent before Almighty God. Be careful. Be careful. Just because you're not engaged and filled with the Spirit doesn't mean that others aren't. I've noticed, I've noticed that this doctrine of the fire of the Spirit, the baptism of the Spirit, the filling of the Spirit, the unction, whatever you want to call it, you better have it. I've noticed this, this doctrine upsets people when they don't have it. When they like, lack the fire and they lack the passion of God. And maybe I should clarify for the theologians out there. When I talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you'll hear that word a lot in charismatic circles and, and sometimes in conservative churches if they're brave enough to step on those on, in, the, in that area. But all it is, in the Bible at least, is being baptized into the body of Christ. You're, you're all baptized into the body of Christ. But there are subsequent subsequent feelings of the Holy Spirit. And Paul being filled with the Holy Spirit. And Peter being filled with the Holy Spirit. And Jesus came out of the wilderness filled with the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Holy Spirit, the unction of the Holy Spirit, the authority of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit. It is the dire need in the churches today. That's why I love what R.A. Torrey said. I don't care if you get the theological term just right and have the power, but I don't want to have, I'm sorry, I, I want to have the power and not have the theological term just right. I want that power. I don't know exactly what the wording is. When you experience the power of God, but there is unction, there is boldness, there is authority. So I want to ask you tonight, have you been rejecting this mighty filling of the Holy Spirit because it doesn't fit in your box of comfortable Christianity? You know what comfortable Christianity is, right? Neat and tidy and in order. This is not that tidy up show on HGTV, whatever her name is, Marie Kondo or whatever it is. This is not, this is a church of the living God. Things sometimes get messy. Sometimes they get loud because things are happening. Think about the early church. Think about the early church. Blind people would cry out, son of David, son of David, have mercy on me. They said, be quiet, be quiet. No, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus would begin to heal. There was a demonic man who thrashed about in 2000 demons came out and went into pigs and they ran down the hill. Thousands, thousands shouted to Peter on that day, what must we do to be saved? That's the church of the living God. It's alive. Blind beggars, leopards, prostitutes, all of them were in an uproar because they were being set free from sin and death. And then what happened when the day of Pentecost had fully come? They were all of one accord in an upper room and the Holy Spirit of God fell in that place. And I often wonder how many of you would be embarrassed to be there on the day of Pentecost. I know there are many Christians who would be embarrassed to be there on the day of Pentecost. Oh no, all these guys speaking in tongues, uh, being excited and in a prayer meeting for 10 days. No, 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 that's not my cup of tea. We'd be embarrassed to experience the power of God. When the day of Pentecost had fully came, they experienced the power of God. And I believe you can have a personal pe Pentecost. Does your, does your life resemble a cemetery? Or does it resemble a life that ex is expecting God to move? So God will revive those who are spiritually cold. If that is you tonight, you can change that. And I do believe that baptism, baptism helps in this area because it's a, it's a step of obedience.
to be baptized and to make that public profession of faith. If you've never done that, I want to encourage you to do that. We're also having them tomorrow after the 11 a.m. service. But they've got the, the baptismal here. The water is heated. It, it, it can ask God, Lord, do you want me to take that step and make this commitment genuine? And then the closing point here is the Holy Spirit revives those who are spiritually dead. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said nobody comes to the Father except through the Son. There's a conviction. There's a drawing of the Holy Spirit. So I don't know who's listening to this. I don't know who's listening to this later. I don't know who's here tonight. But I, are you resisting the, the Holy Spirit, the conviction of the Holy Spirit? Shane, how do I know? Because you don't like what I'm saying. How many times have you heard me say that? If you don't like what I'm saying, it's because you need to hear what I'm saying. The Holy Spirit is convicting and drawing you. Come to God, all your weak and heavy laden, and cry out to him. And the, the self says, no, I am self-sustaining. I am self-sufficient. I am self-righteous, and I don't need God. But the Holy Spirit calls and convicts. And you know the famous verse, pride cometh before a fall. Pride cometh before a fall. Do you know what the, 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 probably the right word on that is actually in the Hebrew language, that word fall is pride cometh before destruction. Paul, pride comes before destruction. Before a man is judged on that day of judgment, before he stands before God, his prideful, arrogant heart, heart stood there and he shaked his little fist at God and said, I will not. I am the captain of my own ship. I am the master of my own destiny. I am self-righteous. I am self-absorbed. I know what I'm doing. I am the God of my own life. How dare you call me to repentance? How dare you call me to bow my knee to Jesus Christ? That's why they say pride cometh before your destruction. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and repent of your sin. The poor in spirit will inherit the kingdom of heaven. Isn't that interesting? The kingdom of heaven. It's funny, the key, the key to the kingdom of heaven. I think about this often when you look, how many of you have little kids or grandkids? Jesus said, come to me or, and come to God with childlike faith. Isn't that so precious? You can tell the kids, come here, come here. Sh look what I have. I found a bunny rabbit and they'll believe you. Or look, the moon, I can touch the moon. I can almost just, what, really, daddy? Really, my childlike faith. See, there's no, there's no pride there. It's a humble, childlike heart that says, mommy, daddy, I trust you. You will take care of me. I need you. Childlike faith that cries out and says, God, I'm lost without you. That's the only way to get to the Father is through the Son with childlike faith and humility and poor in spirit that acknowledges before man that says, I am lost without God. And then once you receive that conviction, you receive that salvation, you begin to sing like many of us, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see blind spiritually. And then your eyes are opened up and you see what is so important to the kingdom of God. So my challenge is to two groups, the modern day Pharisee, the arrogant Christian, you think you know it all. Listen, I'm not, I'm not here beating you up. I've, I've been in that camp and I can slip right back into that camp very easily. Self-righteousness comes in. Knowledge comes in. Knowledge puffs up. Oh, I've read commentaries and I've read systematic theology and I know what God's word says and blah, 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 blah. And I realize God's not real concerned with how much I know, even though that is so important. He's concerned with the condition of our heart. So if you've been prideful and self-righteous, I want to call you to repentance tonight. Say, God, I'm going to be, I want to be emptied to be filled. My anger has got the best of me. My controlling attitude, my manipulation, my gossip, my lust, my appetites. Lord, I tell everyone else what your word says, but I don't apply it to my own life. 
I rule my house with a rod of iron, but I have no gentleness and humility. Lord, would you take that from me? I humble myself to you tonight. I'm talking to you out there. If you're convicted in this area, please do not leave here in that same state. Empty yourself to be filled with the Spirit. And even consider getting baptized if you haven't done that before. It's a step of obedience. I just know in my own life it happened. I got baptized in, in 2000, 20 years ago. And I fought it for about six months. No, nope, no, nope, I don't need to do that. I'm 30 years old. No, 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 no. That won't look, that'll look weird. I'm, I, why am I getting baptized at 30? I've been a Christian a while. I know I backslid, but no, no, I'm not doing that. I'm, no, I'm not doing that. And I just said, you know, you can't, God's not going to be quiet. God's not going that, to, that's why Spurgeon called the Holy Spirit the hound of heaven. He lets the Holy Spirit loose and it keeps convicting you and convicting you. And then, of course, what I just closed with, I want to encourage those who have been dead to God, dead, spiritually dead. You are bankrupt. You don't have a relationship with him. I want to encourage you tonight, do not leave here with, with a question mark in this area of whether you know God or not. Know for sure. The Bible says, if you confess with your mouth and believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and repent of your sin, God says, I see that brokenness. I see that humility. I see that you are poor in spirit and I will come and dwell with you. I will save you and I will set you free.